President Biden tasked you with leading diplomatic efforts to work with Mexico and the Northern Triangle yeah. countries yeah. Uh, to address the root causes of migration. Mm -hmm. um, how do you define success in yeah. this role? It's a great question. <laughs> well, let's first talk about what it is. Um, you know, I come at this issue from the perspective that most people don't want to leave home. From New York, it's the Fauci Awards 2020. As I promised yesterday, I promised snacks. Um, I did not bring them in here, but my mother-in-law made homemade chocolate chip cookies for you guys. So um, there's one for each of you in here. We will do it in a COVID safe way. Um, but thanks everyone and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Jen Snacky. Oh, how nice. Jen Snacky gets <laughs> cookies for everybody in the press corps. Oh, that's awesome. She made cookies. She's so awesome. Kaylee never baked us anything. Sarah and Huckabee lied about baking a pie. That's right. Crank claimed that that was her own. That definitely wasn't. I've seen that somewhere before. Hello. I hope you had a good weekend. We had a good weekend here. Um, we um, I got some progress. Progress happened today, Alice. Excellent. Finally, after I totally wasted yesterday. That was Saturday. The actual burn barrel outside mm -hmm. today was humming. I burned all sorts of leaves, all sorts of scrap wood, uh, old shingles from a, a barn we have, a uh, shed we have. It was a stellar day. I got the burn the burn barrel actually going, and so it was just a cauldron, cauldron, and nothing nothing could survive it. And that's a good feeling. It looks more manicured out there. I don't think you've been out there to see it since. I haven't checked out the outside grounds a lot. Tomorrow's my yard work day, and that makes me very happy. Very <laughs> happy. Um, let's see what else. Yes, we're going into Sturdy Wings tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's Holy Week, right. so we're going to be really good for Holy. This week. is for Lent, not not the musical. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Actually, technically in the Orthodox Church, Holy Week is considered a separate fast from Lent. We do 40 days before Holy Week, and then we also do Holy Week. You know what Holy Week is for me? March Madness. Kid Gonzaga. That's not well, true. Well, today was Palm Sunday. Yesterday oh, was Lazarus Saturday. Well, you came back with um, with um, Pussy Willows. Mm -hmm. Yep, so in the Serbian church, traditionally, the children process with pussy willows rather than palms we had some palms too but uh, good but traditionally it's the pussy willows um and yes and we actually i think this is just a serbian thing i'm not sure if this is all orthodox but serbian people process on lazarus saturday rather than on palm sunday for whatever reason so well good congratulations mm -hmm. um i'm uh, i'm glad you're happy and celebrating you look lovely today thank you your hair looks nice and blown out or something <laughs> all right so this is my big takeaway with what happened this weekend. There's not a lot of like nuclear audio out there. We've talked about some of the stuff. There's the Fauci mm -hmm. Award stuff that you've heard in that is the, the moronic New York Times wanting this uh, this odd, uh, lathery <laughs> relationship with Fauci forever and ever and ever, and so they want to they put together this weird suck up or show where where we hand out Fauci Awards to to all the healthcare officials who made sure that we couldn't go outside without double masks and the same people who for some reason I'm playing coaching softball now with a mask on that is soaking wet when I am done with it it's just a filthy sponge <laughs> and I've been vaccinated and why are we doing this but these are the people and they're mm -hmm. all supposed to get awards because New York Times sucks from New York it's the Fauci Awards 2020 Good evening, and welcome to the Fauci's. We're following social distance rules, of course, so no audience tonight. But we won't let that stop us from celebrating our extraordinary public health officials. They're the doctors and scientists who keep our water clean. Okay, our puke, you get it. <laughs> By the way, this, um, this Lover Boy Sparkling Hard Tea is delicious. Have you had one of these? I did have one. You gave me one earlier. It's delicious, Alice. Mm -hmm. And you know what else? It is out of, they're out of New York. It's, a, it's their own company, crafted by Lover Boy, Inc., New York, New York. Wow. It's delicious. Good for them. Good for them. Yeah, but this this Fauci Award thing was one of these things where I went back like three times and just double checked that the New York Times opinion handle with the blue check mark definitely tweeted this. This really is not a parody. They really were saying 
hi, and welcome to the Fauci's. They really thought this was cute. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. They think this is this is absolutely wonderful. And Fauci did say something today. What did he say that the untaster had? Something said, about, oh, that's right. Oh, he's coming. Right. He's telling us now that it was really kind of a long shot, essentially, that you'd ever mm-hmm. get it outside. So mm-hmm. for, out of a out of an abundance of caution and a degree of safety, he had been lying to us again. Right. So what he said today on ABC's This Week is he told them that it's he said, I think it's pretty common sense now that outdoor risk is really, really quite low. Fauci said on This Week, if you are a vaccinated person wearing a mask outdoors, obviously the risk is minuscule. Um, And then uh, the White House chief medical advisor said new studies about the low risk outdoors will likely shape new guidance. So basically, Fauci's going around saying that soon the CDC is going to let us know that it's safe to be outside right. without a mask if we're vaccinated. But uh, they're not going to let us know that yet, even though they know they're going to let us know that like next week. Because they haven't fully, we get it piecemeal. They They'll break off a little the piece. Statement yet? They're going to break off a little piece of what is the obvious truth and give us a mm-hmm. little glimmer, a little a shaving of what we all know. Yeah. And then what's going to happen is this time next year, Fauci is going to talk about and brag about how much he wantonly misled us mm-hmm. and how it was so useful. One of the things I'm really proud about that I did, other than single-handedly <laughs> come up with Operation Warp Speed, apparently. Is that is that they always knew that this that we were out of an abundance of caution, taking extreme measures mm-hmm. just to be on the safe side. Well, and what they don't realize is that there are always people that are doing more. So you know, and even in mm-hmm. Massachusetts, Massachusetts has a mask mandate outside, regardless of whether or not you're able to socially distance from other people, and. So we're, like, pretty aggressive on the outdoor stuff, even though that's ridiculous. Like, our playgrounds were closed until last year. But our town that we live in refused to even open our playgrounds for more than two months after Baker lifted the rule that playgrounds had to be closed because they weren't sure that they could do it safely. I mean, even when they lift this mask order, even when the CDC adjusts their guidance it's going to take Massachusetts a little while to gear into actually doing something about it. And then it's going to take, you know, probably our town and other towns like ours. Do you think Cambridge is going to rush into anything just because the CDC changed their guidance and then Baker changed his guidance? And then, you know, places like Somerville, Cambridge, our t- anywhere where there's like an overly aggressive public right. health These are presence, all the Portlands of Massachusetts gonna, if you're from out of they're state. They're going to take their time making the adjust, And people are going to demand that they do because mm-hmm. there are still people out there there who think this stuff who are like a kid whizzed by me on a bike and he was definitely within six feet and he did not have on a mask i'm going to go to get a covid test right now he was huffing and puffing all over me yeah Um, i talked to a guy an editor in media about a month ago and and i just brought up i just brought up that this i said the vaccine rollout is sucking here because We've been inconsistent, unfortunately, the whole time. Mm-hmm. I said at the beginning of this thing, and he broke right in and said, you know what? I freaking love Dr. Fauci. I freaking love him. And he couldn't contain himself. And he smiled. He said, I just love Dr. Fauci. I love him. This is a guy in media. You know, you figure, <laughs> wait, now I need you to not trust anybody and, right. you know, verify this stuff, invent this stuff. But no, he was so overcome with emotion because this paternal, warm, soft figure – spoke nice and gentle during a crisis and made us feel good and he held our hands and that's what we wanted all we wanted was somebody to hold us in their in their strong little arms like dr fauci did and it's really pathetic but you've seen this so people like that we talk about people who who aren't who are having their kids play tag in their own yards with masks on people here fauci real adults i'll put adults in (laughs) quotes now because those days are gone Adults believe him, believe the what they're hearing about this disease, even though they, many people obviously are not at risk. They believe everything. They believe, oh, my God, I could die. There is something gross, by the way, about – there's something gross about watching somebody really, really, really desperately show – display how much they want to live. Mm-hmm. It's just desperate. 
It reminds me one time I was in the, in when Filene's was around. I was in the escalator on top of uh, in, in Filene's. Mm-hmm. And the woman in front were going up. The woman in front of me gets her bag or her foot or whatever caught in the the gear, and she's stu- she can't get out loose, and she's shaking. She's trying to get loose. And she's like, oh, I can't get my bag stuck. My thing is stuck. And but so we're all get about to crunch up against her, and I'm like, okay, uh, okay, well, just just uh, just do do your do your best, do your best. You know, everything's. Fine. And the woman behind me goes, "Get out of my way! Get out of my way!" and pushes me and runs up, up, <laughs> off the. Ice. I said, "Jeez, it's that." This is my chili being done. I said, "It's like it's so it's it's gross. Mm-hmm. This thing of oh my god, I've got to save me. I could be at risk here. Oh, oh!" And this reflex, and this thing with people who are otherwise, like the people that I think about are people with kids who are in their thirties. And healthy, and still are so worried. Oh my God, something could happen to me. I know the chances are remote, but something could happen to me. Mm-hmm. It's so important and crucial that I survive. Yeah, and the stuff with the kids. Considering we know that COVID is extremely not a big risk to kids. Uh, the yeah, but way what's it doing to those kids like... when mom is panicking? Yeah, they're no, already uh, God, we've something. already got enough psychos in this land. But so many people are like. It's our children. Better safe than sorry. We can't be too careful with the kids. We have to make sure they're masked. Like, all the teachers are vaccinated, but we're still, like, making sure that all the kids are masked all the time. Because, like, our school district has already told us they're planning to continue masks next school year. And I'm like, that's five months away. How do you know? There could be no COVID at all by then. And they're like, as far as we know, we're going to be continuing masks in September. I'm like, oh, great. Awesome. Like, they're just, people around us anyway are just, like, resigned to go for it. But, you know, we talked to. It could be community spread. Mm -hmm. So we talked to a relative today who was in Florida and said that there's, like, basically no one's wearing masks in Florida. Like, the employees of places are wearing masks, probably because they're, like, required to or whatever. But, like, almost no one just walking around is wearing a mask. So, you know, that's another thing that's interesting because even though Florida, Florida isn't the best state in terms of the number of cases right now, but uh, they're also definitely not the worst. Like Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania that all have mask mandates in place are all doing way worse than Florida is. Certainly way better than Texas where cases are way down. So, you know, it seems clear that the mask mandates at least don't do very much. It's possible that, you know, for some people who are at high risk wearing like an N95 or a KN93 mask makes some difference for that person if they feel that they're at risk. But, you know, especially now, all at-risk people should really have had the opportunity to be vaccinated at this point. Like, we're we're there, you know. Yes, I am just looking for something that we had. Yeah, because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we're now at the point, which we knew would come, where... You know, they will have run out of all the eager beavers for the vaccine and there's going to be like, (laughs) there's going to be more, they're going to have to do more convincing with the next group of people that are due to get it. What's a word that means another word? A synonym? Mm, Yeah. Uh, Yes. Well, uh, well, like, let's say if I call a toilet a John, what is that? It's a synonym for toilet. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have a couple of interesting synonyms here today, Alice. Um, like what? I'm like not... what else besides <laughs> eager beaver? Uh, I no comment. Um, the let the listeners decide if they can. Uh, they Deduce. can figure. Out. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So we played last week. We played this. Uh, we've been doing it every week. This it, it, dumb. Um, AP film writers Jake Coyle and Lindsay Barr are getting you ready for the Oscars. Okay. Thank Breaking you. News. Thank you for that uh, push <laughs> message, uh, AP. That's uh, <laughs> great to know. Whoever the frig that is. So it, this person on TikTok, this one last week, was all angry and uh, you know saying, you know, if you can't misgender me, this and she was yelling at us. And you know, the two weeks ago we had who was the other one, the dancer who said that was hot oh, girl bummer. Or whatever. Yes, hot girl bummer who said my, my grandfather just threw me out of the house. I was trying to <laughs> educate him. We've got another one here. Um, the they reason, just keep coming. <clears throat> yes, the reason I, and it, it just reminded me of like this is how, this is how you 
create psychos <laughs> is have mom worried about mom's survival so much that she's built a bomb shelter in the backyard. So here's a new one. This one is getting is in a fight, a shout out fight with her mother, and is the recipient of some bad news. She tries to stand up for her, her constitutional rights <laughs> to a roof over her head, but it does not go well. You legally have to give me a month. No, I don't, because you haven't paid one brown penny. I, I'm not obligated to, and I le I can't afford to. Guess what? Doesn't matter. You can't Ooh. just tell me I have two weeks to find somewhere! You've had over a month. And no, you haven't! Look, you have done nothing but dig your heels in and try and make me feel bad about your... No, I haven't! Bad. I've been trying to educate you! No, how awesome <laughs> i've been trying to educate you don't you understand she's also like the other girls got 18 different piercings um and it has the blue hair and yes has the outward signs of um of um desperation and needing uh attention and uh, a battery of psychologists Washing. no it's not you just won't listen to me. Oh. You're not going to listen to this crap. Now you talk I have schizophrenia. Whatever, you're an a-hole. I don't. <laughs> it doesn't mean we live in squalor. And it doesn't mean you're a bully. You, I'm not even a bully. You literally dead name me, misgender me, and tell me that, like. Sayonara, kid. <laughs> Whatever your name is this week, uh, you no longer reside here. Let us know where to forward your mail. How great is that? How great is that? And that brings me to... You literally dead name me and misgender me. Yeah, it's funny because, like, literally dead naming is not a thing. <laughs> exactly. Dead naming is not a literal thing. It's a psychological game that you made up that we get to play now. <laughs> so Bill Maher torches the uh, Zillennials as well in what is another great monologue. This one's a short one. We won't play 43 minutes of them like last time. We might as well just <laughs> run the uh, HBO credits. In India, young people touch old people's feet to show reverence. Japan has a national holiday called Karonohi. Respect for the aged day. You know the reason why advertisers in this country love the 18 to 34 demographic? Because it's the most gullible. Yeah. A third of people under 35 say they're in favor of abolishing the police. Not defunding, but doing away with a police force altogether, which is less of a policy position and more of a leg tattoo. <laughs> 36% of millennials think it might be a good idea to try communism. But much of the world did try it. I know millennials think that doesn't count because they weren't alive when it happened. But it did happen. <laughs> and there are people around. How true is that? Mm -hmm. Even as somebody, even when I was in radio like 12, 14 years ago, mm -hmm. I remember when interns would come in and other employees would come in and I'd play bump music with ACDC, whatever, and... I'd say, do you know this band or whatever? And they'd say, no. And I said, this is ACDC. This is like, this was a huge hit in like 1984. And they'd always say, yeah, I wasn't even born in 1984. <laughs> yeah, I you know. I, I'm a Beatles fan too. And I wasn't born, you know, in 1964. It's ridiculous. It I is mean, possible to know about things that happened yes, before you were born. Important stuff happened. I know that the biggest <laughs> thing that's ever happened to any of us was you being born. But some other incidental things happened here and there. I don't remember it. Pining for communism? It's like pining for Betamax or MySpace. <laughs> so when you say, you're old, you don't get it. Get what? Abolish the police and the border patrol and capitalism and cancel Lincoln? No, I get it. The problem isn't that I don't get what you're saying or that I'm old. The problem is that your ideas are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> If you say, let's eat in the bathroom and shit in the kitchen, yeah, that's a new idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't call it interior design. <laughs> you think someone 80 is hopeless because they can't use an iPhone? Maybe the one who's hopeless is the one who can't stop using it. Mm. You think I'm out of it because I'm not on Twitch? Well, maybe I get Twitch. But I just think people watching other people play video games is a waste of f 
fucking time. Twenty <laughs> percent of Gen Z agree with the statement: society would be better off if all property was owned by the public and managed by the government. And another twenty-nine percent say they don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> Here's who does know: anyone who wasn't born yesterday. William Marr, mm -hmm. another great one. Absolutely right. It is remarkable to me. It just watch, mm -hmm. and they're so far divorced from common sense. That's why right, Tucker Carlson's in. He's in trouble now. Whatever this week for saying college, you should not go to college. That yeah. it, it retards you, in other words, <laughs> in ways. Um, essentially, that's what he said. It. That word is still allowed to be used, right? Nobody gets hurt with that uh, word. I don't know. That's the R slur. I thought. Well, that's yeah, but it's used as a noun. This is using it as a verb, right? I don't know. I'm surprised. But, you know, it's in music too. You, I don't know if it's banned from that yet either. Well, well, eh, these kids are as dumb as we think they are. I'm sorry. They're, it's not all. There's not all. It's it's absolutely true. Not all. You have mm -hmm. you have exceptional kids now, but by and large, what's being produced by college ain't great. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not. A, I don't hire people anymore. But I, up till a couple months ago, I did. And I I was never impressed by college, especially the the kids who thought they were super special. Some kid from um what's it what's where everybody was orange. Syracuse? Oh yeah. Oh they were the they were the the best. And I like even fifteen years ago I remember a kid always mm -hmm. had something orange on, always talked about cues. And yeah, I came out of cues, we did a lot of this, and he was just a half assed worker, not great. Mm -hmm. But you know, had like they they made sure that they assembled these kids with the most intact self esteems in the world. And they were just terrible. But the thing is and if you're a 20, the problem is this, is if you're an 18-year-old, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But generally, when you get out in the world, you'll be immersed in uh, surroundings and experiences where you it hits you real hard. Holy God, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. I don't that, that person that I thought I trusted, I can't trust that person. This person, it turns out, is a liar. Um, I'm not the smartest person in this room. This person over here is has a better wit than I have. This girl over here is um, more clairvoyant, uh, you know, than anybody I've ever. You don't know anything. I mean, certainly you can have knowledge instilled in you, and it, it helps to be a reader and, and somebody literate, etc. Do you hear me still? Yes. Oh, okay. I no, I, I lost me for a second. Mm -hmm. But, but, I mean, you have no real wisdom, especially. If you're in the West, if you're an American kid who grew up in the suburbs, mm -hmm. you know very little other than, you know, what you and your dumb friends talk about. Right. And, you know, and this stuff is happening first on college campuses and then it's like bleeding out into the real world. And it's like, I, I mean, you see it. So look at the Micaiah Bryant thing, right? So that happened mm -hmm. in Columbus and the Ohio State students have been protesting, occupying buildings, demanding that Ohio State University sever their relationship with the Columbus police and not uh, work with the campus anymore. You know, now in the meantime, the Columbus police are having to like investigate. I mean, which day was this? Like yesterday, the day before April 23. So it's Saturday. Saturday, they had to investigate because the student's car was carjacked. She was thrown out of her car uh, and thrown onto the ground, and three people ran off with her car. So then the car is still missing currently as of this time. So, I mean, they, it's not like they're not having to deal with real crimes in this area around the university. It's not like they're not having to deal with real problems that the university students are having dealing with crime. And yet the students are like, yeah, let's just... Let's just abolish them. Let's get rid of them. We don't want to have a relationship with them anymore. Like, get rid of them. So, you know, it... Well, but, but, but also, but to get back to what I was saying a little bit, mm -hmm. is if you're 18 years old, you don't know anything. And the problem is, is that college is an artificial terrarium. Mm -hmm. Where that's not the real world. Sure, if your car gets stolen, you, you learn a little something. When I, I used to date a girl in college, and... <laughs> I loved this. Uh, it, well, she was in college. I was uh, older, and but uh, so uh, but I used to thank you. <clears throat> Go show Sally, please. 
but I used to. Da- okay, thank you, thank you. Go, so Sally. There you go. Get it, get it, get it. Get it. <laughs> um, <coughs> it doesn't work with him. But um, Hi. there thank we you. go. But so it was so. <clears throat> hey, this was Trinity. So these were kids who were doing very well. It's a it's a nice school. Actually, it's worth Tucker in. Hmm. And there was a spate. And I thought this was hilarious because Trinity's stuck in the middle of a bad neighborhood in or was then. I don't know if it is now in Hartford, Connecticut. And so what was happening was that dudes <clears throat> the, the, is that guys from the, the hood right around the college mm-hmm. were going on to campus saying, hey, come here, finding, uh, you know, the, these know-nothing, wide-eyed suburbanites who were mm-hmm. in this little enclave f- f- away from home for the first time and saying, come here, walk, walk with me. And they would just walk them to the ATM and make them get out hundreds of dollars. <clears throat> Yeah, but that's like they don't understand. Part of what they don't get is that their artificial terrarium is propped up by having things like the police and capitalism and other things that they think that they don't like. Right. And like the more they try to actually dismantle these things in the real world, once they get out of pretend fairyland, then... They're going to learn the hard way that there were reasons, maybe, that they had a relationship with the Columbus police at Ohio State University. Maybe the Trinity College students are going to find out that there's a reason why well, we have, like, police departments. Well, and- but my girlfriend then at the time <laughs> mm-hmm. was a white girl from money, from suburbs. I had no money at the time, and I remember seeing her her Fidelity account and seeing that it, like one of her accounts there had $800,000 in it. Yeah. And I was like, I'm a bellman, like scrapping to make like 18 bucks, like during an overnight shift. I'm like, can we just take that and live a really fun life? No, but <laughs> that's why I was meant to not be rich. But, but anyway, but so my, the, the thing is that she joined, she was a super progressive. Mm-hmm. You know, for the time, really, it, she she's the one who read my our bodies ourselves and made me read it. She's the one. She joined the the Asian Minority Club and the Black Minority Club and the, this club. She joined every club to show every group how guilty she felt and that she was, mm-hmm. you know, she was a standard issue, good suburban liberal progressive for the time. Mm-hmm. And as and they had a fake thing where they all protested in front of. <clears throat> the dean's office and demanded that like more money be given to the to whatever Polynesian uh, APAC, what's that, what's that, who's the P- Asian Pacific, whatever. AAPI. Right. And they wanted something now, whatever, and the dean said, we have to wait till next budget. And they said, no. And they all had this protest. And she said, yeah, we went there. And she said, well, and she said that he asked that, that a few of us come in and talk to him, but no, because in Rules for Radicals, whatever it was they're reading, that they say never to do that, never break up. Make sure that the person comes out and speaks to everybody. Don't let them come, just uh, you know, uh, uh, slink off or whatever. Don't let them tell you, just a few of you to come in to talk to them because they'll try to use you know intellectual trickery on you. In other words, they'll out debate you and <laughs> out argue you because you're stupid. <laughs> but that's fine. But but I thought to myself back then, I thought, wow, everything that she's doing there in that school. All this performative stuff, all the club stuff, all the all mm-hmm. the progressive stuff that she's learning, all the Marxist stuff that she's learning. You know, she they had her thinking like, why does anybody have guns? The cops should seize the guns. What should happen is that's what the police are for, you know. And so if the family gets slaughtered, well, to have order, you know that that's fine. Then mm-hmm. then the police go and they dem- have an investigation. And I said, well, wh- what if I don't want to get murdered? What if I want to have my family be safe? She said, no, 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 no because it's. There is that's what the government is for. Government is for to facilitate every part of your life. I thought she spent four years in that place. The only kids who learned a damn thing were the ones lucky enough to get pulled down to the ATM where some <laughs> hood was making intimidating them with a knife or gun or just a mean look, intimidating them into emptying their bank accounts. It's like those people who were lucky enough to have that happen to them, they learned something about the real world. Yeah, that's you know, true. you know, having a fake um, uh, protest with the uh, based on rules for radical mm-hmm. radicals, where the dean could give a damn, 
You know, that's a waste of time. Makes you feel good. Makes you have something. You, that way you can go tell mommy and daddy something on Thanksgiving. And then they'll say, oh, well, I feel good about the 50 grand we're paying or whatever it is now. It's mm-hmm. very expensive. But it, it, that's why, I mean, what are we doing to our kids? Why are kids going directly into college anyway? Right. The only reason you should go to college is if you have something that's difficult to learn another way. I mean, it's difficult to become a chemical engineer unless you go to college. So if that's your passion and that's what you want to do, then, like, you can go and learn that, you know, because you don't have, like, a chem lab at your house. Oh, right. right. Exactly. There's stuff that sometimes you can't learn unless you're in a place where it's set up for that. But, But there is now... You know, a lot of these colleges are obsolete, and I read something really interesting about how um, now that there's been COVID, a lot of these colleges are realizing that they can just do courses remotely, right? So, but if you can just do courses remotely, what's the point of differentiation between these different schools? I mean, like, Harvard is still going to be Harvard and Yale, and these places are still going to exist. Like, they'll survive what's coming, but... A lot of these sort of mid-tier schools, like, what's really the point of differentiation between them? There's going to be a race to the bottom. Like, why would you attend, you know, Syracuse over anywhere else if you're not getting to, like, wear orange and do stuff? Like, if you're just sitting on your sofa with your laptop, like, what's really the point? Right. You know? So... At that point, those schools really have to think about what the point of them is and what they want to be. And I think a lot of those schools are going to go out of business. But on the positive side, I think there are certain people doing really innovative things with innovation. There's Lambda School, which is a totally online school um, that is free. Right. But you're talking about learning. Right. right? And with certain colleges, of course, we're talking about um, credential capital. Right. Where you you buy a college degree. Exactly. And your friend gets wasted with Muffy, uh, Folger, um, you know, uh, Harding, Cooper, Waspo, and <laughs> so you've got the right networking. Right. Yeah, this is good. And so so some dumbass can get into work hard enough in finance because Muffy's dad will get him in and eke out a really good living. <laughs> right. So, but – I think it it's an interesting time in higher ed for sure because I think a lot of people are saying now, you know, we've had Paul in Florida tell us this too, that, you know, he wonders sometimes why he's spending money to have the kids come home over vacation and tell him he's privileged and and <laughs> <laughs> didn't Sorry, work for Paul. anything because he's white or whatever. Um, no, Paul in Florida emails us a lot. He's great. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that that a lot of people are starting to really question this on a much more mainstream level than they have in the past. And in particular, when you're having that college student sitting on your sofa with their laptop for a year or, you know, locked in their dorm room and unable to leave. Yes. You know, I had a relative who got they have to have like a fresh COVID test every three days or their residence hall fob locks them out. So they got locked out at like 11 p.m. because their COVID test expired. They didn't. They needed a new one on file, and they were locked out of the dorm and had to like reach out to resident services to get back in. This was at BU. So there's like, I mean, when the college is treating your kid this way, and or you're just having them back at your house, and and the value of the degree is diminished and they're brainwashing them into all this crazy stuff and you're paying them $60,000, you start to wonder, like, what what benefit exactly am I getting out of this deal? And then add on top of that the way the world is changing in terms of skills that people need and you have people who are doing, like, Lambda School that teaches people to code for free but takes a percent of their salary for the first two years. So they, like, guarantee to find you a job coding and they just get a percent of whatever you make the first couple years that Mm -hmm. you make it. And then, um, you know, you have places like the American College of Building Arts, I think it's called, that's in, uh, it's like ACBA, that's in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and they give kids a standard um you know liberal arts degree but also teach them a trade like carpentry or you know something real that they can do so there are places that are doing innovative creative things that are adding value to education and these places that are stuck in their ways are absolutely going to get washed away and they should Mm -hmm. they should i mean you look at the it just uh, employers to to produce kids 
it says so much about the about uh, the university mm-hmm. that you've got all of these happy TikToks where kids are saying what they just learned and feeling that they're educating their parents. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would think that somewhere in this college they would say, hey, guys, I know we all enjoyed this class today, but don't go home and think they're, that you're going to teach somebody something from scratch because they're going to think you're a jerk and may throw you out. <laughs> that would be useful. But, you know, it's it's the, no, it's the high arts are, are taught. You know, we're not here to teach, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the, the tangible, useful everyday skills right. which really you should have oh my god i mean I, I i i it's it's great but then again it's not as fun like that same girlfriend you know when i was 23 years old used to come home to me and on the weekends and tell me all about all about um you know how the interactions that happen between races and how people how um how different races feel the attitudes they have how they feel about working in capitalisms capitalisms what capitalist how they feel they, they work work in capitalist free market society yes capitalist society and, and free market occupations mm-hmm. and how they hate it and they resent it and this and that and i always would say to her but how do you you're reading about this stuff talking about this stuff with the professors discussing this with you i work with the freaking everybody from around the world in my job mm-hmm you know, from uh, everybody from around the world, from uh, we had people from Africa, we had people uh, certainly from from Asia, people from everywhere. I work with these people. We talk to each other. We talk. I see how hard they work and what they feel mm-hmm. about uh, capitalism, and they were busting their ass, obviously. So you, why do you t- get to tell me? Because it costs you seventy five thousand dollars, and you get a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Like, but you get to feel really good about what you do. My my experience does not count whatsoever. Doesn't I, that, that doesn't matter? You know, it's so it's whatever. It, it's it's anecdotal and it sounds like uh, I'm complaining, but it's just pathetic. It's it's you know what? I'm gonna be positive, and that's one of the reasons, Alice, that mm-hmm. you used to have people who grew up in working class capacities, right? As the press. You know, mm-hmm. they had been, they had to enlist in the service, had to start at a small town paper doing zoning board uh, meetings. If you could get the job and, you know, and, um, you know, court, you're sitting in court watching arraignments and school board things and all sorts of, you know, gritty street reporting, crime reporting, mm-hmm. all the dirty reporting, not glamorous reporting. And so by the time these guys got to TV, and I'll even put Dan Rather in there and in the, his generation, they had seen a whole bunch. They had work. They had put the time. They worked a whole bunch. It's not like going to Columbia where they mint you now as an elite, an elite journalist. And I love that name, journalist. Sometimes they'll say journo, just disgustingly <laughs> obscene. But so they're not. That's why the White House press corps. That's why Jen Psaki has no problem. That's why it was um, uh, Ben um, Rhodes who said it was easy to get the Iran deal done. Because these morons would never question anything we said. These in the press corps, they're dumb. They're twenty five years old. They're clueless. They don't know anything about history. You know, they want to be seen as being with the cool kids. We're the Obama administration. All of them wanted selfies with the president. So it's easy, and it still works. And Jen Psaki knows. All they had to do is make cookies, and these <laughs> people absolutely melt. As I promised yesterday, I promised snacks. Um, I did not bring them in here, but my mother-in-law made homemade chocolate chip cookies for you guys. So- they can't contain Aww. themselves. These Yay. are adults. They can't contain <laughs> themselves. I've worked in places here where we've had cupcake day and, <laughs> hear, and I've heard adults like, oh, cupcake day, as if they're rare. These people can't contain themselves. Wow, cookies. You don't <laughs> see those a lot. I mean, those uh, those are pretty hard to come by. She's getting his cook. Whoa. To the point where they interrupt her with their uh, enthusiasm and surprise. Oh, my God. It's cookies. Guys, this is incredible. It's like all of them just got bingo at the same time. <laughs> oh, bingo, bingo. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So um, there's one for each of you in here. We will do it in a COVID safe way. Um, but thanks, everyone, and have a great weekend. Wow. Really? <laughs> What is this? Wow! <laughs> she didn't get you a G five. She got you a 
cookie, which probably sucks. Let's be honest. It's probably an oatmeal or fruit. Homemade oh, chocolate chip cookies are pretty good, I think. Is that what she said they are? Yeah. I can't I can't imagine that the chip count is high enough for and my- And there her mother-in-law made them, so not Jen herself. So if Jen made them, I would agree with you, but it's possible Jen's mother-in-law is a good Stop cook. Stop defending people, Alice. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome, kids. My pleasure. Make sure you're here on time next week. I'm just saying there's no need to necessarily disparage the quality of the cookies when we it don't sucks. really know. I know by personality types. <laughs> Progressives can't make good food. The foods that are meant to be overindulgent, they're not good at it. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. A, 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 only a good conservative knows how to make a cookie be a cookie. <laughs> and it should be 50% chocolate chip to 50% dough at the minimum. Mm -hmm. It can be 80-20 chip to dough if you want to. That's acceptable. There shouldn't be sparingly chips. And and you better have a court order and a lengthy explainer if there are nuts. What about it, raisins, Thomas? <laughs> anybody who does that should be executed. Anybody who puts a raisin where a chip should be should be incarcerated. And depending on... Depending on the uh, uh, the number of times should be incarcerated. That's my criminal justice reform. <laughs> All the low level street stuff on on pot violations, you can let them all go. Mm -hmm. I want people to who expose their souls, and you do that when you make a crappy cookie. I want those people incarcerated. That is my platform. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh yeah, that's right. This is the same kind of people, of course, who need aged rappers. To explain to them, uh, <laughs> why? Why did we even do it? Run DMC wants you to take a vaccine. You got the vaccine. You got the vaccine. They got the vaccine. We got the vaccine. We can get back to normal. Let me inform you. Let's all get the vaccine. It's about community immunity. I'm talking unity for you and me. If Doc says it's good, then trust me, it's good. Now let's all get the vaccine. There is none higher. DMC, I will inspire. Time for us to trust and not the So I don't have a... <laughs> There's so I don't have a problem with I, I'm I'm I think Run DMC are talented guys. Um, enjoy them just fine. And in this city, it's a pity because it just can't hide. Tinted windows don't do nothing. They know who's inside. See, but you're very hip, honey. Thank you. Uh, but and that's fine. And I understand that they're this is targeted. I assume to to minority communities. They're trying to get vaccines mm -hmm. out there and say don't be afraid of it. I realize that that uh, colleges have been scaring the hell out of you about the. Uh, about the Tuskegee Airmen, et cetera, uh, and validly. <laughs> uh huh. But um, but uh, you know, take the vaccine, and I understand that. But there's also just something that doesn't sit right with me that whoever, and I, I don't know if this is Columbia University or, or a CDC thing, but somebody said, you know what? You know who the black people will listen to? No, don't hide it in books. That's not for them. <laughs> just you know, what? put it in a rap star. And a rap lyric somewhere. They'll listen to, to a rap star, you know? Just like the, the, just like, you know, and for the whites, the white uh, trash Trump people, throw it in the NASCAR somewhere. They'll understand that. Don't, don't put it in, in smart programming. Mm -hmm. They don't understand. No, this is absolutely the same group of people that sat down and was like, we need the stupid white Trump voters to take the vaccine. Let's see. NASCAR, 700 Club, um, Deadliest Catch. That's all stuff they watch. They're the same people who sat down and were like, okay, now the minority communities aren't taking the vaccine. Let's see. Rappers. Yep. Um, I'm sure there's like advertising on BET. I'm sure there's like all kinds of stuff that they've thought up that's like the same thing because that's how they think. They're like the most right. obvious. It can't be that this uh, five foot four, uh, four hundred seventeen thousand mm -hmm. dollar a year paid bureaucratic jerk. It can't be that he's lied to us and maybe minorities along with whites are smart enough to figure that out and say, you know what? I don't trust that person. I'm right. going to hold off for a second here. Maybe mm -hmm. that's part of the problem. Rather than ever having any kind of <clears throat> self-evaluation. Right. It's just, all right, what condescending, pandering thing can we do next to I mean, try I to think work around? I mean, I the Marshawn Lynch thing was much better handled than this because they gave Marshawn Lynch the opportunity to actually ask thoughtful questions about safety and why people were hesitant. And and that actually got at the root of, the, of 
you know, I think why some people were hesitant. And I don't know if that convinced anybody or not. But I think it's certainly... I mean, Fauci's still condescending because he can't help himself. Right, but, but it's I think certainly that the- better than whatever this is, where they're like, "Community immunity, get the vaccine. Time to trust and not to trust." Yeah, the doc <laughs> says it's good. Uh huh. Like that. It's so like just cringy. Was, I can't. I, that was fairly hot. What? That was fairly hot. <laughs> I don't know what that what you're talking about. I think guys will agree. All right. Um, so the the biggest takeaway I've got from this weekend from the Sunday shows was Kamala mm-hmm. Harris, and I'll be writing about her. She'll be in my Substack tomorrow. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. She was on Face the Nation, whatever Dana Bash is on, uh, CNN, and she is. We knew that she was. Mm-hmm. We knew that she was the quintessential vacuous politician. Right. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't care to know anything. She doesn't care that you can notice she doesn't know anything. Mm-hmm. When she was saying, it's a debate, Colbert, that shows you right there. She can care less. She is a social climber, and that's what she's trying to do. She's mm-hmm. trying to get a better gig and a better gig and a better gig, and it worked. But she has no, there. there is nothing compulsion whatsoever, no compulsion whatsoever to gain any depth of knowledge on these issues. So this is the listen to the question and then the answer. This is Dana Bash. Kamala has this cup co- knows this is coming. Right. And this is, it's been a month that she's been in charge of the border and exactly. refused to mention the border or go there. She's pretending our country doesn't have a border right now. And you can tell even during the question as K- Kamala's making these uh validation noises, you can tell that this this question is dead on arrival by the time it reaches her. Let me ask about immigration. Of course. President Biden tasked you with leading diplomatic efforts to work with Mexico and the Northern Triangle yeah. countries mm-hmm. yeah. uh, to address the root causes of migration. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yep, yep. I absolutely, mm-hmm, yep, I absolutely comprehend. I absolutely comprehend everything you're saying. So much more. Yep. Mm-hmm, I'm all over this. Competence, competence, competence. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, how do you define success in yeah. this role? It's a great question. Yeah. Well, it's a great question. You know, and something that I'm completely competent on. I'm glad you asked that. So let me answer the question directly. Directly. Let's first talk about what it is. Um, <laughs> Why are we? T- what? What is? Yeah. What are you, <laughs> no, she knows what it is. We all know what it is. We all know the immigration issue. There's a problem at the border. We've been noticing this. CNN yeah. knows it. That's why she asked you about it. Yeah, you now have over 20,000 children in the custody yeah. of our government. That's what it is. We all know. Yes. We don't have to go back at all. We don't need any more context. You know, I come at this issue from the perspective that most people don't want to leave home. <laughs> I think that's belied by some facts in the ground. I think most people want to leave home when home is Honduras or Guatemala. And the U.S. is available. Right. They don't want to leave their grandparents. They don't want to leave the place where they grew up, where the you know they speak the language, where they know the culture. She has done zero work, as they would say, on answering this question and explaining this. Yes, they do. They want to leave. They're not going to Djibouti. They're not going to Canada. They're going to the United States of America because it's awesome here. Mm-hmm. Yes, they want well, to leave home. They want to call Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Boston and your town home. They want to very much. They want to so much that they're willing to spend thirty grand to do it. They're willing to work with the with these coyotes and gangsters to do it. They want to leave home and have a new home. Is this not something that she realized? People have been doing this. In regards to America, for 400 years, people keep coming here. Mm -hmm. They keep leaving home. So, I mean, (laughs) you know, maybe not 100% of them, but certainly enough. Um, The place where they're from, the place that is home. Most people don't want to leave home, and when they do. Why are we getting a psychological, an an absolutely inaccurate psychological breakdown of these people? You know Mm -hmm. what? I could tell that nobody, people don't come to the United States for 
you know, an opportunity and, uh, you know, the, uh, an idea of total freedom and democracy mm -hmm. and uh, the opportunity to make, you know, 800 times more than they would ever make anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, in a... It's usually for one of two reasons. They're fleeing some harm or they cannot stay and satisfy the basic necessities of life, such as feeding their children and having a roof over their head. That's that number two, the mm -hmm. basic necessities of life. Yeah. You're not just meeting the basic necessities of life when you go from Guatemala to the United States. You are exceeding. If you want the basic necessities of life, you could stay in another country or go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. This is the place to be still somehow. Right. And it's interesting because... I think really what's happening here, and I think progressives have been trying to do this for a while, is they're trying to elide these two um, concepts of refugees literally fleeing violence, which is what we have asylum claims for, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we still have some collective guilt as a country about, say, like, that we didn't do more for people fleeing the Holocaust. We turned away the ship that had the Holocaust refugees on it. I think we still have collective guilt, even just about during the Obama years, the Syrian refugee crisis that Obama caused with his irresponsible way of handling the Syria war. Um, and you know, and we had the images of the children, you know, dying on the beaches in, in Europe and all this stuff. Be and people were saying, like, it's refugees. They're fleeing. We have to do something, you know. So now but now we're trying to apply the same set of moral rules to people who just want a better life for themselves. Yes. And why are we trying to do that? Uh, Because Biden wants to let them all come here. Because we're out of answers. Mm -hmm. You know, in my, my in my opinion, anyway, we're totally out of answers in the board on the border. We don't know how to do it. We don't want to do it in the way that Trump did it because we've been preaching against that. Mm -hmm. We've made that uh, verboten amongst big progressives as well, and we ran on that being verboten, right. verboten. And so we can't do it the way Trump does, and we're out of ideas. Mm -hmm. So the problem is they don't really want to come here. The problem is we their place just sucks. So. What we're going to do, since we can't figure out how to do things on the Texas border, we can't figure it out. We're out of ideas. That's why kids are stacked up right now. Mm -hmm. This is a cop-out. So the new idea is, okay, we can't do the border. Everybody agree in the room, in the, ca in, the, in, the, in the cabinet room? Anybody agree that we're all too incompetent to do this? Yes, yes, I agree. We all agree. Okay, great. The majority agrees that the, the matter is settled. So why don't we fix their hometowns? And this is what we've heard. This is street lights. Right. This is now. So what we street lights what, giving people yes. money to stay. Exactly, giving them actual cash. We don't know how to fix anything here, so we're gonna go back and just make everybody so robustly um, fruitful mm -hmm. that their situation is on par with our situation. Yeah, instead of having them come to America, we'll just make the whole world into America. Right. Perfect. That sounds very doable and reasonable, and I think that will work out well. That, that, that is part of a big part of what is going on. So I look at the issue of what's going on in the Northern Triangle from that perspective. And then my take on it is that we've got to, understanding that, we have to give people some sense of hope. So that's understanding. So in other words, Dana Bash, I've pushed aside your question. Of how do you define success? Exactly. And I've established a new premise mm -hmm. that we're going with. <laughs> so you now have to play in my playground of this new question. So understanding that, it's settled, by the way, Dana, who's not asking the follow-up and not arguing. That if they stay, oh, that help is on the way. And... That brings me to then my focus, which is, for example, I convened a group of members of our cabinet, um, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Commerce, the head of the USAID, which is our... So the tween girls are using bags as toilets, Kamala. <laughs> yes, we have a so crisis. It, right. No, it's not, ha it's not about people who never want to leave home. It's not about hope about staying that they don't have mm -hmm. hope they're in the they're using bags on the border now 
So you convened what? In Washington, D.C.? Aid organization. Um, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, was a part of it. Jake um, Sullivan was a part of it. And, and if the 20,000 kids or whatever it is were in the cabinet room, that would be good because that's the problem. Mm -hmm. But they're not. They're down in Texas, thousands of miles away from Vice President Hope. <laughs> And bringing together members of our cabinet to do what, for example, is going to happen out of commerce, which is they're going to convene a, a trade mission virtually now, and then the hope is in person later. With agriculture, Tom Bilsack is going to increase our focus and our resources around helping the farmers in that region who have been devastated by crisis in terms of climate yeah. and, and drought. Mm -hmm. USAID ID, we're increasing our disaster Huh, you know so he... that we're sleeping four to us piled up right now um, and we're defecating into bags. But you notice uh, United States Air Force jets keep flying over us on the way to Honduras <laughs> to prop up the farmers. So wait, why is our agriculture department working on Honduran farmers? Like you said, they're all states now. <laughs> we have to fix. We don't know how to fix this. So Not only you're all in the just... United States now. It goes down to, to Brazil. <laughs> you're all under our purview now. The whole world's agriculture problems are now Tom Vilsack's responsibility. Yes. Response because again of the hurricanes. So this is the kind of work that has to happen. The kind of work that has to happen is the diplomatic work that we've been engaged in, in term, including my calls to the president of Mexico, the president of Guatemala, um, and, and we have a plan to actually have a, another meeting. Um, a plan to a meeting to convene. <laughs> my to talk calls. about how my we calls. can make Honduras better. Yes, <laughs> Not, my calls. So in the meantime, all the kids in the camps, what do we... I know you haven't showered <laughs> for four days, but Tom Vilsack... Can you, is there a translator so they can know? How do you say that right? Tom Vilsack's on his way to Mexico. Coming up soon. Are you going to go there? In that regard, it is, yes, we're, we're working on the plan to get there. We have to deal with COVID issues, but. So mostly not, is what I'm saying. Are you going to go there? Yes, but no. <laughs> I can't get there soon enough in oh. terms of personally getting there. Do they not get a plane? I think she gets a plane. Mm -hmm. Get on the plane and fly. <laughs> Bring Tom Vilsack. And then, and then we have to also look at the piece about community-based organizations. The piece. Organization. So, for example, this week, in addition, or next week, in addition to meeting... Some week, doesn't matter, because it's not going to happen. ...again with the president of Guatemala, I will be meeting the following day with the community-based organizations in Guatemala. They call them basically civil society to figure out how we can... Well, how about the community in Guatemala, Guatemala that is currently festering in Texas? Can we work on that community? Yeah, any ideas, Kamala? Better it's... assist what they're doing on the ground mm -hmm. in a way, again, that they can give the resources to people who naturally want to stay at home and give them some sense of hope that help is on the way. This is the work that we're doing, but it's not going to be solved overnight. It's a complex. They keep not wanting to naturally stay at home. <laughs> Have you noticed that? It's a steady line of them coming up. Incredible. Issue. Listen, if this were easy, it would have been handled years ago. Well, that's what I was going to yeah, ask you when yeah. President Biden said, um, you know. Seemed all right last year. Would you like to do this or not? Would you like to? You will do this? Did you say, oh, gee, thanks, Mr. President? No, he asked me to do it, yeah. um, just as he was asked to do it. Joe Biden, as vice president, had, was asked by President Obama to focus on the Northern Triangle. Mm -hmm. And he has asked me to do and to carry on the work that, that he did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get back, get back to the question that you've asked. Um, we're making progress, but it's not going to evidence itself overnight. It will not. But it will be worth it. And I will tell you, part of my approach to this is we've got to institutionalize the work and also internationalize it. If you're a 12-year-old kid and you're in Texas and somehow you're getting, hearing this and understanding what she's saying, you're like, okay, I see. So we're screwed. Interesting. Huh. Which is why, for example, I'm working with Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. And we're going to be increasing the request we're making of our allies in the United Nations. Because, again, this, this is about the Western Hemisphere. 
Um, Thanks, we are Kamala. a neighbor in the Western Hemisphere, and it is also about understanding that we have the capacity to actually get in there if we are consistent. Part of the problem is that under the previous administration, they pulled out, essentially, a lot of what had been the continuum of work, and it, it, it essentially came to a standstill. Yeah, Trump did it. Yeah, They pulled out all that mm -hmm. stuff because they had the problem controlled. You're rebuilding it. We have to rebuild it. Thanks, and, and And I've made it very clear to our team that this has to be a function of a, of a, of a priority that is a, an American priority and not just a function of whoever happens to be sitting in this chair. Because, for example, looking at, again, the root causes, extreme weather conditions has had a huge impact on one of their biggest... Send Tom Vilsack. <laughs> sure that right. Extreme weather conditions. <laughs> It's not the, the Biden telling people to swarm the border when he gets elected. No, no, mm -hmm. no, no. no. That's a, was that a weather condition? Uh, industries, which is agriculture, including drought, right? Mm -hmm. And so a residual point. The point is to keep people from getting into the country when the world's not perfect. Right. That's the situation. That's border policy. That's yeah, immigration think... policy. The thing is, is that the earth... The world is not stable. If mm -hmm. it were, we wouldn't need any of these policies. It boggles my mind that they can't solve, like, the simplest problems here, and yet somehow they think they're going to cure global poverty and violence and, you know, unstable states and uh, and heal the planet from ever having extreme weather again because we know that never existed before, you know, fossil fuels. Right. So, so we're going to give... So we're going to solve all the... Instead of telling people not to come to america and closing the border we're just going to quickly solve all those problems first because that yes. like to avoid it's like mr bean to Congress avoid de de dealing with the tiniest little yes. problem you're gonna do seven million other things that you have absolutely zero competence to do and in the meantime this is sucking up all of our federal resources what the heck is our agriculture secretary doing working on farming in honduras what is you know why are all our commerce secretaries and people why is the u.s cabinet trying to solve all the internal domestic policy pro policy problems of every south american nation that's nuts to think that we can do that and is that's nuts. why you we know what can't. else you know what then that's totally why she's not going to the border because mm -hmm. if she goes to the border that then you know codifies that the problem is on the border and they don't want us thinking that mm -hmm. the, the problem is not on the border the problem is in guatemala where there's no hope yeah so we're gonna have she'll go down there mm -hmm. she's gonna go on a foreign trip down there because stop looking at the border that's not the problem the problem is what's happening in places where the hurricanes hit in central america yeah the problem it's is so that... cynical by the way mm -hmm. it is incredible you're in charge of this crisis where's the crisis in texas okay i'll be in el salvador <laughs> great and to think that you can solve the problem of people having hope in guatemala is just it's ridiculous you can't at one point people's hope resides in america in a lot of cases right. for a reason and of course we all want to have an immigration system where well i mean maybe not ev there i'm sure there are some people somewhere who disagree with this but 99% of like normal people that I know want an immigration system where people who love America and think it's great and want to work hard and want to be here should be able to come in in a reasonable time frame when they want to. Um, but unfortunately, because we keep kicking this political can down the road over and over, we just refuse to actually have a functional immigration system where we can like vet people at all and let people come in. Not only is it about the economic devastation and what we need to do to assist with economic development and relief, but it's also, they've got extreme hunger there mm -hmm. and, and food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do to address that, because again, yeah. if parents food and, and if children cannot literally eat if they cannot have the basic essential things that everyone needs to live, of course they're going to flee, and that's what we're saying. We're going to fix the world. Yep. So, I mean, that's not even... I'm constantly told that we have tons of food insecurity in America. So since they haven't been able to solve that, what makes them think they can solve it in every other country on planet Earth? 
This interview is so, I'm going to get more cuts probably for tomorrow. It's so worth watching. President Biden always said that he wants you to be the last person in yeah. the room, particularly for big decisions, just as he was for President yeah. Obama. He just made a really big decision. Afghanistan. Yes. Were you the last person in the room? Yes. Uh, no. I think. Because <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know so anything about it. I do. And, and, I, and I'm going to add to that. Um, yes. Go ahead. Add to that. This is a president who has an extraordinary amount of courage. He is someone who I have seen over and over again make decisions based on what he truly believes, based on his years of doing this work and studying these issues, what he truly believes is the right thing to do. And I'm going to tell you something about him. He is acutely aware that it may not be politically popular or advantageous for him personally. It's really something to see. And I, and I wish that the American public could see sometimes what I see. Because ultimately, and the decision always rests with him, but I have seen him over and over again make decisions based exactly on what he believes is right regardless of what maybe the political people tell him is in his best um, mm -hmm. selfish interest. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Ms. Harris, is it possible you didn't study for this interview? <laughs> I mean, I'm the fact that she's saying that in particular about the Afghanistan decision is hilarious to me because the implication seems to be that he is choosing to get the troops out of Afghanistan by September 11th, not because that date has any particular political significance at all, but simply because that is the exact right, best time in his view with no political considerations at all, but purely from the facts on the ground, what, the right moment to pull the American troops out of Afghanistan is coincidentally uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. That's absolutely just a coincidence and not a political calculation at all. Yes, it's not based on popularity. He it's not based not on being... popularity. He's doing. The, he's going to do the right thing and take them out on September 11th, even if, you know, that uh, has n no political meaning at all. He's going to do that purely just because that is the right thing to do and the exact right moment to do it out of absolutely pure coincidence. There is a little piece here where she does make a little bit of news. I don't think I'm trying to. Um, and through that process, I think that we um, we arrive at a good place. And ultimately, of course, he is the president and he makes the final decision. Do you feel a special responsibility given the fact that... I, listen, I carry a great, great weight of responsibility um, knowing that there are so many people, again, the generations of women who fought for and imagined there would be a woman vice president or a woman on the ticket. And I think of that all the time. There has been a woman on the ticket a couple of times. Decision. <laughs> Do you feel a special... That um, it is often the case that as I will ask his opinion about things, he will ask my opinion. And, um, and through that process, I think that we, um, we arrive at a good place. And ultimately, of course, he is... Bringing itself to bear right here in the White House? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, you'll recall that um, when Joe Biden asked me to join him on the ticket, he did so with a, 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 a sense of intentionality, of purpose. No <laughs> Intentionality. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. There's a great... Um... There's a, another part. I, I'll get it. I'll get it for tomorrow. There's another. Um, uh, there's another thing that she says when, when oh when Dana Bash asks her about it being a hundred days in, and she went out to say that she was so excited about something but couldn't come up with anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just um, it was just uh, odd because she should have come up with something. She it's just going to be so wonderful. You don't under, the things what we're doing. You have no idea the things that we're doing. But she, you know, at one point she does laugh, of course, because she laughs herself out of the room, out of every room that she's on. Uh, all right, Alice.
Anything to add? Are we out of here? Talk tomorrow? I know. We got to go watch the Oscars. Oh, yeah. That's right. I good. Who's, um, <laughs> I have no idea is, what's uh, nominated for anything. Is, I have to be honest. I, I couldn't know. name a movie. I couldn't name a well, movie. Well, you watched that one, Nomadland. You've probably yeah. seen more Oscar nominated films than I have. I watched have Nomadland because people I trusted told me to watch it. And Frances McDormand is a great movie, but it's like t- just terrible and t- terrible in a van. You know, I don't even know what to, to say. It was it was not it was not a pick me up, but who knows? Maybe there's a good movie out there. I seriously doubt it. I'm gonna watch the one with the tiny Yoda. Maybe that's the thing <laughs> that I'll get into. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, another week. It is the Burn Barrel Podcast with Tom Shattuck and Alice Shattuck. You can find us on Twitter at Burn Barrel Pod or at Facebook.com slash Burn Barrel Podcast. We're also now on a website, BurnBarrelPodcast.com, as well as on Gab and on Parlor. We're at Burn Barrel Podcast on both of those. Um, you can shoot us an email if you want to, BurnBarrelPodcast at gmail.com, or check out our YouTube channel, too, if you prefer that. <laughs>